Friends, as most of you know, or better know, very soon it'll be Valentine's Day. Now why the blue heart and the red heart? Well, as many of us know from experience, some would say from bitter experience, Valentine's Day being about love and romance and passion, that can go one of two ways. It can go well or not so well or not very well at all. I wanted to share with you a rhyme about that from Rhymes from the Mountains. <clears throat> Mommy Goose, you see this guy and girl here facing opposite ways. The young man says, love me, love you, kiss and coo. I hope we don't fall out. If you break my heart, I'll break yours too. And that'll be turn about. Well, Valentine's Day, where did all this get started? We have to go back to what today is called Italy. More than 2,000 years ago, there was a festival. It's a mouthful. It's called Lupercalia. Lupercalia. That was a fertility festival where the young men and young women would go through these rituals and they would cast a lottery, and then based on how the lottery came out, they would pair up for a year. And I read that often these pairings resulted in marriage. Now, if they often resulted in marriage, that means sometimes they didn't. Blue heart, red heart. Sometimes it worked out, and sometimes it didn't. Well, Lupercalia participated uh, uh, persisted until about the 5th century. But the Pope of the Holy Roman Church at that time decided that was too pagan, so he changed the name to St. Valentine's Day, celebrating two martyred saints, uh, both named Valentine, and as is often referred to in love, they lost their heads, literally which is perhaps another reason why the, red, the heart is red. But then we come all the way up to the 14th century, and the first person to be given credit, mostly, all of this is a little fuzzy, for definitely associating Valentine's Day with romantic love was the English writer Geoffrey Chaucer. Now, any time I mention Chaucer, I think of my mother, Hazel Norris Flannery, because she had memorized some Chaucer. In fact, she memorized a lot of things when she was growing up, and they were of great comfort to her as she got older. In fact, that's one of the reasons that Mommy Goose makes the promise that if you learn her rhymes when you're young, they'll come back to you in old age and be a comfort. But Mother could say the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Not only could she say it, she would say it in Old English. Now translated, it would say, When that April, with its showers sweet, the drought of March has pierced to the root. In other words, when the spring rains come and end the drought. But she would say, One dot April, with its shorter sota, the throat of March hath pierced to the rota, and bothered every vein in swish liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the floor. She would say the whole thing, and she would, she would get proud, and she would get energy from that. Now, when I went through high school in McKee, memorization hadn't fallen out of fault, as it has in recent years, though it seems to be making a comeback. And I had to learn the prologue to the Canterbury Tales in Old English as well under the wonderful teacher, Alpha Hayes, who some of you all may remember out there. Now, Alpha had the gift that some teachers have and some teachers don't. She could make it come alive. And when she was describing the different characters in the Canterbury Tales, the Miller and the Wife of Bath and different ones, I never will forget she came to one called The Cook, and she described what a wonderful cook this man was. He could prepare the meat so that it just fell off the bone and practically melted in your mouth. 
and his soups were just delicious in the extreme, and his bread was delicious to taste. It was just wonderful. There was just one thing that wasn't so wonderful, she said. As Chaucer describes him, he had a sore way down on his leg, but it was a running sore. And then she asked the class, she said, now, why was this such a problem? He, he doesn't cook with his legs. He's cooking with his hands up here. Why, why did Chaucer want to bother to point that out? And none of us answered. We were all afraid of getting it wrong. So then Mrs. Hayes told us, she said, well, maybe while they were traveling to Canterbury and it got real hot, the cook would start to perspire a little bit and he'd get sweaty and get itchy. And maybe that sword, that running sword, start to itch it. He'd reach down, scratch it a little bit, and then he'd go back to cooking. Well, I never forget. That's that's why the cook was a perfect cook, and yet not quite perfect. That's the way that all of the characters in the Canterbury Tales are, and in my experience, the way most of us are. We have our good points and our bad points. Now, when I got to Eastern. And when I was a sophomore, I had to take World Lit, and we studied the Canterbury Tales under Dr. Bino Rhodes, certainly one of the best, maybe the best professor I ever had at Eastern. He was one of those that could just make it come alive. And the day that he introduced Chaucer, he quoted the prologue to the Canterbury Tales to us. And he said, now during the next two weeks, you all are going to have to memorize that and recite it back to me. He said, but I'm not going to take class time for that. After class, each period, I'll reserve a little time and I'll go out and meet you in the hall. And when you're ready to recite it, you come up and, and I'll check you off. Well, when class ended that day and Dr. Rhodes left, I came up to him out, out in the hall and I said, well, I'll, I'll recite it right now. And he said, well, I, I only just said it. He said, are, are you sure you're ready to recite it? And I said, yeah, I think I am. So I began one dot opera with a shorter sota, the oath of March hath pierced it to the rota. And I went through all 18 lines. And Dr. Rhodes said, Well, Norris, I'm impressed that you got that so quickly. Now, at this point, I had a decision to make. I could have told Dr. Rhodes that I learned those lines two years before. But I have to tell you, in all honesty, I decided not to overburden Dr. Rhodes with information, and I just said, thank you, Dr. Rhodes. And after that, for the next four years, through my undergraduate experience as an English major and in graduate school, Dr. Rhodes treated me with a little extra degree of respect. Now, did I lie? Well... Not outright, I just simply said, thank you, Dr. Rhodes, but I sure didn't tell the whole truth. And that's something we experience a lot these days, deception by omission. So I have to, I have to own up to that. Now, coming back to Alpha Hayes, students at McKee High School, they nicknamed some of the teachers, and it was, but it was only the ones they didn't have a lot of respect for. And they didn't nickname Mrs. Hayes because she was good and everybody knew it. And just like the situation with Dr. Rhodes, that had an influence for four years. And it reminds me of the power of words. And again, I go back to the high school at McKee. And not only did the students nickname teachers, they nicknamed other students but generally only students that had some flaw, something they could pick at, something about the way they looked or the way they sounded uh, or the way that they behaved, they would get a nickname and it wouldn't be one that they would choose for themselves. So I'll share that one with you. And this is uh, from Mommy Goose about a boy that looked different because he was missing an eye. It's called One-Eyed Jack. And Mommy Goose says, when One-Eyed Jack came to school, his classmates called him One-Eyed Fool. But when the teacher gave a test, his mark was better than the rest. He thought that this would end the curse, but no, it only made it worse. 
and worst of all was Betty Lou, once number one, now number two. She'd make odd faces behind his back, then close an eye to make them laugh. When teacher said that faces weren't nice, she had hummed the tune to three blind mice. And through it all, Jack sat in his chair. His cards kept close like he didn't hear. It was like a wall she couldn't break through. Each time he did nothing, her anger grew. One day after school, she ran ahead. When Jack came by, she turned and said, You think you're better on account of grades. But if you could, I know you'd trade. People act like they care for pencils and books. If they told the truth, they care more about looks. What you have one of, I have two. I'll always be that much more than you. Jack raised his head and made this reply. That last you said I'll not deny, but I see this with my one eye. You'll cry twice more tears than me, and half the bad you see, I'll see. And when I close this eye and sleep, my dark to yours is just as deep. The thing I have that's over you is to see more kindly with one than two. She stood not knowing what to say. His words had taken hers away, and all the night she lay in bed trying to hush the voice in her head. She kept to herself at school the next day, and when Jack was teased, had nothing to say. The others looked up to Betty Lou, and seeing she had stopped, they did too. The days grew frosty. Time wore its track, and school was just school, and Jack just Jack. He still had no friends and ate alone, but one day after the others had gone, she came to his table and looked in his face, and Jack moved over and made her a place. From that day on, they sat side by side, and soon others came to sit with pride. That year she gave just one valentine. It said, Dear Jack, will you be mine? So that one came out this way. Now, I hope that your Valentine's Day is good. And sometimes these colors can cut both ways if the bluebird of happiness may have flown. Mommy Goose puts it in this perspective. She says, though the bluebird may have flown, she'll surely find her way back home. So stay safe, stay warm, and choose your words wisely. Bye-bye.